I could go on for quite some time about the uh, productions that uh, Scott has written, produced. Uh, you may have seen The Informant, uh, Contagion, Side Effects, uh, Born, um, Oceans. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to have him here with us today, and he will be with us on some of the other science storytelling seminars uh, to talk about uh, his perspectives on science storytelling. Before I give the microphone to him, I will say that uh, he has a distinction of having been so true to science in the story that was told about contagion uh, that one of the advisors to the film, uh, who was at Columbia, uh, was active in establishing a scholarship for students studying emerging infectious diseases that's in the name of Scott Burns and uh, his uh, director. So, Scott, please. So, yes, I am, I'm much more of a, a storyteller than a scientist, so it's, it's nice to be here um, among non-storytellers, although I'm sure that's <laughs> not really who you are. Um, so, why don't I start a little bit by talking about science and fiction. Um, when I was growing up, I read a fair amount of science fiction, books by Jules Verne, things like that. Um, and then, it's interesting, you know, I, I, the other day I looked up the history of science fiction, and there's a, I don't, is anybody here a science fiction fan? My people, I'm very happy. <laughs> um, you know, there's this thing every year called the Hugo Awards, um, which is given out to, to science fiction. And, and Hugo, who started, I think, a, a magazine called Amazing Stories, maybe in the 20s or something, really coined that term and created an artificial genre. And I personally object to it. I think that most fiction and most good storytelling should be influenced by science. Um, and the fact that it's become a genre, I think, in a way, works against a lot of us um, <clears throat> in a lot of really sort of interesting ways that have to do with the publishing world. And even the world that I come from, Hollywood, sort of, has a kind of now, has a disrespect for for science fiction just because it's genre fiction and it lives in a different part of the bookstore. Um, if you've ever been to a bookstore, I guess we don't really go there anymore. <laughs> I do. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I was um, on a board at Sundance for the Sloan Foundation and they give an award to a movie that used the science better than any other story or any other, any other movie that year. Um, and it was hysterically funny. It was me and it was a professor from MIT and a couple of other sort of scientific people and I think one or two other writers. And the movie was a movie called Another Earth. Do you guys know this movie with Bert Marling? Um, and we would have these conversations. In the movie, there's another planet Earth that has appeared about where the moon normally is. Um, and there's these two Earths and Clearly that can't happen, and we would have lots of conversations about gravity. <laughs> and it brings up a point that's really important to me, and I'll get to it, because um, I'm going to show you guys some clips from some movies, because I always liked it when people showed me pictures. Um, so, you know, the interesting thing that when I started doing storytelling that involved science, the early movies that I did, I realized that that science, in a, in a sense, provided people, or provided a writer with a surprise. And the third act of a movie, um, and just to give you guys a little quick screenwriting lesson, um, I'll, I'll save you guys like the $10,000 you would pay for a seminar for a weekend. Um, a movie has three parts. <clears throat> They're called acts. I call them the beginning, the middle, and the end. Um, and I'm willing to bet that, you know, every experiment a scientist does is a story and probably very closely follows that shape. And in fact, I think most stories are also experiments in that really what that first act is, is the establishment of a hypothesis. You create a world and you invite people in. And in the second act, you realize that the rules of that world that you've invited people into may not be what they appear to be. And in the third act, you have to resolve the fact that there was this world you invited them into that has rules that may not work very well. 
and resolve it in such a way that is surprising but believable to them. And believability becomes really important. And so whenever I've done a movie, as opposed to, and I'm, I'm not knocking anybody else's movie, but like I would have a hard time writing Iron Man because people don't fly around in big suits like that. Although I understand there's jetpack technology, I think actually developed by someone maybe at Stanford that I heard about the other day. Um, but for me, what I've always told the scientists that I've worked with is I want to know what's possible. I don't want to, as we would say in the business, jump the shark. So tell me what's possible. Tell me what can happen. And it becomes a really interesting exchange because sometimes, like in the case of Contagion, I had written a scene where a survivor's blood becomes a, a hot product on, on a black market. And someone shows up, and the scene didn't make the movie, but there was a character who showed up at Matt Damon's house realizing that he was resistant, and his client wanted to buy some of Matt's blood. And we got rid of it, and it was really interesting to me to see two weeks ago that story appear surrounding Ebola, um, along with pretty much every other thing that happened in our movie, sadly. Um, and, and talking about whoever was talking about advertising, you know, the tagline for Contagion was nothing spreads like fear. Um, and I think that that's really the epidemic that this country is going to face. I, I really don't think from, I've worked with a lot of the people who are involved at CDC, and the fear part of this, and if you can watch the way the news is covering it, you know, it's, it's sort of, again, this failure in storytelling, and that if we get the information out um, correctly, a lot of the fear would go away, but I can pretty much talk about the public health for hours, and I don't know that that's what Martha wants me to do, but um, I'll show you some clips from that movie as well. The other thing that I was going to say is science is a great tool to me as a writer because of the surprising nature of outcomes. Um, I was on a panel in New York last year, and I can't remember the name of the neuroscientist who was with me, and I wish I could. But he gave me the, the greatest tool that, a, that an advertising person or a screenwriter could ever have, which was there's a study that actually shows your brain turns off the moment someone utters a cliche. <laughs> because it's no, it has other stuff to do. It's a very busy organ. And, if it, and correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, but... but um, it was really fascinating to me because as a storyteller, it makes sense. It, it's why we're grabbed by unexpected endings. Um, and if you know what's coming, you know, if I say a bird at hand, I don't really need to keep talking. Your brain's already finished my sentence. Um, and I think when we talk about and complain about Hollywood endings, it's because we've gotten into the situation where we very, very frequently air on the side of the cliche, the happy ending and all of that. And I think what we're seeing now, because there's so much content coming out, interesting characters that we really do respond to, like the characters in Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones. Um, and I think it's because your brain is woken up by a new version of storytelling. Um, anyway, um, why don't I show you some stories that I tried to tell. And if you guys <clears throat> want to ask questions, um, I'm, I'm better at answering them than just lecturing. Um, so this first thing I'm pretty sure is going to be from an inconvenient truth. And, and what Martha said is largely true. I had seen Al speak in front of a group about this size. And he did an amazing job of giving a science lecture. And it bored pretty much 90% of the people in the room. And all of us were people who probably liked Al Gore and probably cared about climate change. Um, but it was really long. And, and when we started making the movie, Davis Guggenheim and I sat down with Al and said, you know, from a storytelling standpoint, we have two, uh, two objectives. And they're sort of very basic to, to all aspects of filmmaking. Is we have a character in our movie. And his name is Al Gore. And he had lost the election in 2000. And some people felt he had been treated horribly. Some people feel he abandoned you know, their 
hopes and their boats by not fighting as hard as he might have. Um, and Al went underground, and our movie was the first time Al had kind of come back to life. And I think it helped our movie a great deal. Um, and so there was a movie I had seen that oh, I'll be really happy. Has anyone here ever seen a concert movie shot in San Francisco called The Last Waltz by Martin Scorsese? All right. Um, it's a concert, but Scorsese did this great thing in that you know, it was a performance, but interstitially, our little scenes of the band, which is the music group that the movie is about, and you see the band on the road talking about what their life was like on the road, and it provides context. And the big problem that we had with Al was how do we recontextualize this guy that everybody feels they know, but a lot of people really don't like. Um, and and how do we do it when he's the star of our movie? Um, and Al was very adamant about, you know, the point of this movie isn't me, the point of this movie is climate change. And we kept saying, you don't understand that when you're making a movie, you have characters. And Al was our character. And so I would encourage you when you think about the stories that you have to tell to realize that characters are going to be a big part of it. So why don't I just show you an example of how we tried to marry those two things. And compare it to a thousand years of CO2, you can see how closely they fit together. Now, a thousand years of uh, CO2 in the mountain glaciers, that's one thing. But in Antarctica, they can go back 650,000 years. This, incidentally, uh, is the first time anybody outside of a small group of scientists has seen this image. This is the present day uh, era, and that's the last ice age. Then it goes up. That We're going back in time now, 650,000 years. That's the period of warming between the last two ice ages. That's the second and third ice age back, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh ice age back. Now, an important point. In all of this time, 650,000 years, the CO2 level has never gone above 300 parts per million. Now, as I said, they can also measure temperature. Here's what the temperature has been on our Earth. Now, one thing that kind of jumps out at you is, well, let me put it this way. If my classmate from the sixth grade that talked about uh, Africa and South America were here, he would say, did, 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 did they ever fit together? Most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But they did, of course. And the, the relationship is actually very complicated, but there is one relationship that is far more powerful than all the others, and it is this. When there is more carbon dioxide, the temperature gets warmer because it traps more heat from the sun inside. In the parts of the United States that contain the modern cities of Cleveland, Detroit, New York, uh, in the northern tier, this is the difference between a nice day and having a mile of ice over your head. Keep that in mind when you look at this fact. Carbon dioxide, having never gone above 300 parts per million, here is where CO2 is now. way above where it's ever been as far back as this record will measure. Now, if you'll bear with me, I want to really emphasize this point. I, the, the crew here has tried to teach me how to use this contraption here, so if I don't kill myself, I'll... It's already right here. Look how far above the natural cycle this is. And we've done that. But ladies and gentlemen, in the next 50 years, really in less than 50 years, it's going to continue to go up. When some of these children who are here are my age, here's what it's going to be in less than 50 years.
you've heard of off the charts. Within less than 50 years, it'll be here. There's not a single fact or date or number that's been used to make this up that's in any controversy. The so-called skeptics look at this and they say, so, that seems perfectly okay. Well, again, if on the temperature side, if, if this much on the cold side is a mile of ice over our heads, what would that much on the warm side be? Ultimately, this is really not a political issue so much as a, a moral issue. If we allow that to happen, it is deeply unethical. I had such faith in our democratic system, our self-government, I actually thought and believed that the story would be compelling enough to cause a real sea change in the way the Congress reacted to that issue. I thought they would be startled too. And they weren't. The struggles, the victories that aren't really victories, the defeats that aren't really defeats, they can serve to magnify the significance of some trivial step forward, exaggerate the seeming importance of some massive setback. April 3rd, 1989. My son pulled loose from my hand and chased his friend across the street. He was six years old. The machine was breathing for him. We were possibly going to lose him. He finally uh, took a breath. We stayed in the hospital for a month. It was almost as if uh, you could look at that calendar and just go, and everything just flew off. Trivial, insignificant. He was so brave. He was such. Uh, he was such a, a brave guy. Just turned my whole world. Anyway, um, I'm going to stop there just because time limit. Um, but the goal here again was get a guy that we knew that people knew. We all felt that that hockey stick graph, as we called it, was the best clearest thing to show people that climate change is real. And then we felt right after that we needed to change Al. We needed to show people that Al was somebody who had a kid. Al was somebody who acknowledged that he had failed with Congress. And that if we did that, maybe we could reframe our character or get our audience to change their mind about the character. And then they might accept what he was saying. And, you know, if you look outside today, I don't feel we succeeded, but I, I hope that in time we will.